the evening now. Um, and Bruce, I've already mentioned that you use the term fruit salad community um, on your publicity for this evening. So um, yeah, it'd be really good to just hear a bit more about what what that means what where do, i mean what on earth do you mean by that <laughs> yeah i mean maybe maybe before before i answer that question i, I think i think one of the things that that was central to our call here and the way that god spoke to us is that that god made it very very clear to us that we needed to be and must be intentional about building relationships uh, across ethnicities, okay. especially given the country's history. And, 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 and let me tell you why that's important. What, one of the great dangers when you are a, a foreigner called by God to serve in another part of the world is that you end up doing ministry to people, mm -hmm. but you don't end up sharing life with. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, actually, that has a long and, 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 and I have to say sad history. Um, I, and I want to be careful here because there are, there are Christian missionaries who, you know, came here in, in bygone eras who weren't part of the sort of toxic colonial em enterprise that was about stealing people's land, but nevertheless would set up mission stations which created a kind of parent-child relationship. Yeah. You know, yeah. they brought with them the Bible and they brought with them the gospel, um, but they also brought with them the, the, the prejudices of sort of the Enlightenment era. And the Enlightenment era basically said Western, our progress was going to civilize the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the process, didn't just bring um, uh, the gospel brought uh, you know brought their own prejudices with that and i you know i guess you know i guess you know future generations will will also judge our expressions of christian witness with a mixture of of good and bad but 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 actually you know it wasn't about shaping people in the likeness of christ whilst recognizing the positive rich things within their own culture it was about saying we want to make you you know, a, a, a white British expression of what it means to be a Christian. And so, you know, there wasn't really a sharing of life. It was, we've come to impart to you what you need to know in order to become civilized. Um, and, and so that has a long history. And I think, you know, when we moved here, we wanted to avoid that kind of top down. And I'm not saying we've succeeded, but we wanted to try and avoid that kind of you know, parent-child kind of approach where we're here to help you, you know, we're here to be your messiahs and to be your saviors. And there's only one savior and his name's Jesus. So don't even try and get the gig. Um, and, you know, we wanted to avoid that. And, 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 and so we wanted to be intentional about um, ensuring that, you know, our lives were shared with people who have a, a different story and a different life experience from us and that and, and I think that's been the case and one of the I think what one of the signs and symbols of, of that was a couple of years ago it was Louise's 50th and now everybody knows your age um, but it was Louise's 50th and we Younger you know we invited you, sort of 60 70 people along to that and uh, and actually it, it, it you know it, it, it was beautifully multi-generational and multi-ethnic uh, and that wasn't contrived. That 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 was that was simply the result of the 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 people that we've come to know and have become part of 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 our lives. And um, and one of the, I, I think one of the sad things at the end of that evening is um, one of the, the 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 pastors who was there. Um, he 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 actually said to us that it was very rare he's south african you know now retired in his in his late 60s he said you know it's very rare to actually see a social gathering like this um and that's an indictment yeah. against the body of christ and it's and it's yeah. witness here in south africa that given our history here people basically socialize in their their ethnic silos 
Um, and, and actually, I didn't, I didn't see that as a kind of pat on the back for us. I actually saw that as, you know, an indictment of, 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 of our witness as the, the body of Christ. It shouldn't be exceptional. Yeah. Um, so in answer to the, the, the question, Fruit Salad Church, I, I can't yes. even remember exactly how that, that came about. But I, I know that, you know, Capricorn, Capricorn is a really diverse community. It's economically deprived, but, but it's, it's pretty much 50% uh, Cape colored. Um, and that is a contested term, but that's, you know, J Johnny, Johnny would be defined, would define, you know, be defined culturally as Cape colored. You know, that's not a politically incorrect term uh, here, in, here, in, here in Cape Town. I know that's problematic in other parts of the world uh, to call someone coloured. Um, um, and, and then the other 50% of the, the, the population would be Corsa, which is, which is Nelson Mandela's background, or yeah. refugees, um, or immigrants from other parts of Africa, you know, Congo, Malawi, Zimbabwe, etc., uh, Etc. So it, it's actually unusual because it's it's quite it's it's a little bit more diverse. Um, Cape Town is is still pretty much divided by the architecture of of apartheid. So yeah, people yeah. live in the communities that were defined by by that system. Um, so so it's a little bit unusual, even though it is economically deprived. And so that's reflected in in our church. And actually, most of the churches in a, in our area are, are are you know they are they're, they're kind of monochrome. You know, it'll be a Malawian church or a Zimbabwean church or a coloured church. Uh, but actually, our, our church from from the very beginning was intentional about being multi ethnic. We and 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 that was reflected in in the congregation. And uh, yeah, I can't remember how it came about, but I I think. I was sharing one Sunday. I can't even remember what the, the, the passage of scripture was, but I decided to have a bit of fun with something. And I, d I didn't know if I was going to land up in a whole heap of trouble. Uh, but, you know, with family, and if I landed up in a whole heap of trouble, then I'd get corrected and put right. But um, I, I just, just played around with the notion of, you know, we're a fruit salad community. So, you know, isn't it great? You know, in a fruit salad, it's, you, you know, we often hear this, this idea about um, melting. a melting pot. I don't want to be in a melting pot because everything becomes indistinguishable. I don't believe that's God's plan. I believe God wants unity and diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, people, you know, our cultures all need, um, you, you know, they, they, they need the redemption of the gospel. But there's beautiful things in all of our cultures that reflect the diversity that God originally intended for his creation. And, um, you know, that's reflected in, in, in the church. And so, you know, started playing around. You know, we've got Malawians here. What fruit are you? Oh, we're mangoes. I don't know. I can't even remember what it was. We've got Rwandese here. What are, what are you? Oh, we're, we're oranges. You know, we just played around with this. And I was a little bit naughty because the majority in the congregation are coloured and you know, I said us white folks were apples, but we got, you know, we, 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 we've got to be what? Um, um, we'll be we must be, we must be Granny Smiths because we're English, right? So, you know, uh, and then, um, um, you know, and then I left it at the end. I said, I've left anyone out. And, you know, half the congregation go, yeah, you've left the coloreds out, right? And I said, well, do you want to know what fruit you are? And, and they go, yeah, go on then. And I said, well, you're bananas, you know, so, <laughs> so, so. So uh, kind of left it there. Bad joke. Sorry. But um, uh, yeah, and, and we kind of played and it stuck. Uh, it stuck in the church. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, if, if you're Rwandese, you, you know, you remain an orange. Uh, and, but, but there's something, isn't there? there? There's hard work in creating a fruit, fruit salad. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, but it's far more interesting, isn't it, than just eating bananas all the time. You know, it's really boring if you're just eating bananas or if you're just eating apples, you know, um, and, and, and fruit salad's beautiful. You know, you get different flavors yeah, and they don't exactly. stop being those flavors. But, but actually, when they come together, they bring out, um, yeah, they bring they out the richness better. and they just taste better. Um, and, and so for us, that's become, you know, I think over the last seven or eight years, that's become what we're striving to be uh, and striving to become um in a community where when things go wrong because 
there's limited resources and people are scratching around to survive, you know, people are divided by their ethnicity. Um, and, you know, we need to be a sign and a symbol of, of, of reconciliation and hope in, in a divided community. So Bruce, you know, thinking about some of the biblical um, uh, precedents and the biblical thinking about this, you know, what would you say to people who say, yeah, but surely, you know, Paul said that there's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no slave, there's no free, you know, we're all sort of one now uh, in the family of Jesus. How does that fit in with this idea of being a fruit salad and our distinctiveness being important? I, I, I think the first thing I'd say there is, is, is Paul is, 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 is ultimately, is ultimately pointing to that unity we have in Christ, but I don't think he's pointing away from diversity. Um, it's the very nature of the Trinity to be unity in diversity, you know, and, and we are image bearers. So we're called to reflect that as image bearers. You know, God's intention was that the first human beings, he gave them a, he gave them a creation mandate to make something of the world. And as, 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 as human beings spread out from, from the garden and took Eden with them. I think it was God's intention that, that, that we would create cultures, not one culture. So I think there's kingdom values and kingdom principles that we're called to reflect. But I don't believe it's about creating some kind of monochrome kind of... Uh, I, I think that doesn't reflect who God is and, and who he's created us to be. And I think we get a sense of that in the, 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 the Tower of Babel story. Because in the Tower of Babel story, yeah, they're trying to build a city with one language and one culture without God. And that wasn't God's intention. God's intention was that we would you know, be scattered to the ends of the earth and make his glory known to the ends of the earth by, by making something good out of his creation. And as people spread out and, you know, come across different animals and different vegetation, you're going to create different foods. And when you create different foods, you've already created different culture. Um, you know, you're going to, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to come across different goods that you're going to, you, 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 you know, that you're, you're going to create from. And so different cultures were, were, were intended, I think, by God. So, and I think that will be reflected in, in God's future. You know, we're told in Revelation 7 that, yeah. that all the nations will, will be gathered together and those dressed in white, that's those who are, are children of God, you know, will be gathered from every tribe. Every ethnicity, uh, every nation, every language will be represented. Isn't that a, isn't that a glorious picture? Uh, and we will be one in Christ. But we're also told later in Revelation that the treasures of the kings, and that's not just talking about, you, you know, if we understand the biblical story properly, we were made to be kings and priests. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's saying the best of human achievement the best and richest parts of our cultures will somehow be woven into the, the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and, what I, and, and, and actually, that's not just something for the future, uh, although it is. I think that's something the church is supposed to grasp hold of now because we're supposed to be a signpost to where history is going. And, and, and history is going to, you know, whether, we like, whether people like this or not and they want to hear this, just as the trajectory of history is towards justice, the tra tra trajectory of history is towards multi-ethnicity, you know, and the world is getting smaller and it's becoming globalized and there are problems with that. And I recognize that there are challenges with that and it's not all good because it's not all surrendered to, 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 to God and his kingdom. But, 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 but actually it's not something that should scare us. It's an opportunity for us as the people of God mm -hmm. to actually ref reflect God's character, mm -hmm. but also actually where history is going. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. so, uh, you know, I, I, I can get really excited about this because this, this, this is the stuff that gets me up in the morning now. Um, you know, God's given me, a, you know, God's given us a, a picture of the future uh, which which is supposed to break into our reality now and in a in a society like South Africa divided by race divided by a brutal history of oppression based on the color of people's skin um, 
it, it becomes an imperative of the church to to not take any shortcuts and sadly the church in south africa has taken way too many shortcuts and has as as preached at best a cheap reconciliation that hasn't involved real repentance in many sections of the church and that's seen in the fact that we still live separate lives mm -hmm. and there hasn't really been any kind of restitution and redistribution of of the wealth that was was taken from the majority populations here so you know there's huge challenges here for the church this is this, this for me is less a political issue and more an issue of the church capturing the vision of what it's called to be yes yeah Bruce, that's fantastic thank you so much um louise can you give us any sort of sense of how you've seen this work out you know this vision that bruce has outlined have you seen that work out in practice um Sure, oh, how do you answer that question? I mean, I know, it's a big question. It is a big question. I mean, it plays out. I mean, it plays out in, in just so many ways. I mean, it plays out in where we choose to live. It plays out in where we choose to work, where we choose to worship, how we choose to worship. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it plays out in, in, in kind of choosing to build relationships, actually in hearing, listening to God. It's like, God, who, who, who are you bringing across my path? Mm -hmm. Who, who yeah. are you wanting me to, to build a relationship with? You know, who are you wanting uh, to be a friend to me and me to be a friend to them? You know, um, it, it doesn't work with everyone, you know. Um, you, you know, there's so many, uh, I think it it's, works out in being willing to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um in willing to be brought up short uh, <laughs> um, you know some people um, aren't in that place yet <laughs> you know so it's kind of like actually who are the people who who um, you can build a relationship with where there's a chance of it getting off the ground there are so many assumptions we have about one another that they yes. can get in the way yes um, yes yeah you know and 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 so kind of you know i think that's where listening to god and 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 seeing where god is is taking uh taking us you know and i know for bruce you know it's around the people that uh, uh in in sport that god brings across his path um and for for me it's about um it's also about not having all the answers um there's a you know and actually being willing to have your western mindset challenged about you know like we know the way to do things and we're good at being organized and da, 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 da. but sometimes it gets in the way um you know i i kind of have to remember i am a guest you know i am a guest in the communities that i go into and i i need to hear and i need to listen and i need to learn and yeah, I've got stuff that I can give and I've got stuff that I can offer um, to, you know, uh, you know, but it, but it's there by invitation. You know, when we go to Capricorn, I am there by invitation. And in fact, it's only the fact that I'm there by invitation or that we're there by invitation that actually also makes it safe or safer. <laughs> you know, if you just go in and think like you can do this and you can do that. Uh, you know there's so many things that i think i now see things I, I just think you know it's been such a journey of sort of learning to see things differently of of learning to um see things through other people's eyes and through other people's experience and expectation i i see more of the um way racism plays out in people's lives and in the structures of society and it really gets under your skin you know <laughs> it's yeah, you know the yeah. things shouldn't be like they are um you 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 become more sensitized to your own privilege you know um yes, yes. and the discord of that you know like we have one foot in you know like on one level we're you know incomparably rich and on another level we're not you know like you have a foot in different worlds and i guess as christians we shouldn't be that shouldn't be foreign to us because actually this world is 
in one sense it is our home but it's not our you know as it is it's not our home um you know god's kingdom is our home and and kind of working that out um so so yeah so i i think it's it's kind of like a a dawning humility i think that's great yeah louise thank you that's so that's really really helpful actually just to yeah that idea of being a guest actually and the privilege that we have of being a guest in a, another culture and being humble about our own blind spots as a culture. Great. Well, we'll, we'll come back to Bruce and Louise in a, in a bit, but I, I'm really thrilled that we have uh, Jonathan Armagam with us this evening. He's a former professional football player. Uh, so, Johnny, it's uh, it's fantastic to have you with Actually, us. Actually, Danny, Danny, can 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 I just before Johnny dives in I here know, because I'm there, the boss. There, here, no, mate. no, mate, because. Because this, this honestly, this, this doesn't have to mean anything to you. You've got no idea what a special moment this is. Oh. Not just because it's Johnny, but James is on this call. And I'm, 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 I'm sorry to, to kind of point you out, but James was at Leicester when I was chaplain. And, and I would say he was the first professional footballer that I mentored. Yeah, uh, in his time at Leicester. And... And Johnny was the first pro footballer that um, I mentored in, in South Africa. Um, and they, they both like playing on the right as well. So, you know, and, and they've got no idea. They've never met. But I reckon if they got into the room, they are so similar. Like, like in terms of character and personality. So you, you've got no idea. I didn't know James was going to be on the call tonight. And I'm just like so made up that these two... Are, are here at the same time no that is fantastic it really is i mean you know and if there's any upside to the pandemic which i hesitate to say that but <laughs> i guess one of them is that it's become a bit more normal for us to sort of connect with one another um across the world i mean i was on a call last night with people from ghana you know and um uh and uh yeah it's just an amazing privilege to be able to have access into each other's room so it's very easy for, to get, for us to get zoomed out isn't it but it really is amazing that we have all these connections so so johnny bruce rudely interrupted you you know which you're probably used to by now um but <laughs> anyway johnny it's fantastic to have you with us this evening and johnny why don't you just tell us a bit about uh, what your about your family and i know you've retired from football uh, professional football so tell us a bit about what you're up to these days Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> hi, Danny. hi Danny. So I retired from football about four years ago and I teach at um, a school called Ubuntu Football Academy. I've been teaching for two years. Two years ago I had no idea that I would be a teacher. I didn't want to become a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it was surprising. It was a surprise when God steered me in that direction. So I'm teaching now for two years and I do some coaching as well. Brilliant. That's great. Tell me, tell us a bit about your family. So I'm married um, to a beautiful woman called Crystal. We've been married for 11 years and we have two girls. One is nine and one is three. Oh. Three old is called Jesse and the nine year old is called Christian. Wonderful. Wonderful. And tell us a bit about how you, uh, how you first came across Bruce and Louise, how you met them and how your relationship has developed over the years. So we, me and Bruce met at a coaching clinic or coaching course in Newlands and we, it was a funny story how we met, but the gist of it is we connected really well at the beginning. Right. Um, Bruce was very passionate about football. I, I just came to Christ after, yeah, I just came to Christ, Christ just saved me. And then we walked, this, this was in 2010. And he walked the journey with me. He mentored. He mentored me in the in um, my early stages of being a Christian. And yeah, the relationships flourished into a brother and a friend. So yeah. Oh, that, oh, that's wonderful to hear. That really is. And that's a bit of a reflection on some of the things Bruce has been saying, isn't it? Which is fantastic. And and moving on from what you know, some of the things Bruce has been saying. And this is a you know quite a personal question, Johnny, but. It's really good to hear about your perspective on the legacy and impact of racism, of colonialism, apartheid. Um, how has that, you know, has that all affected you, uh, your family, your community? We'd be really interested to hear about that. 
Yeah, so just thank you for organizing this. Thank you, Bruce Louise and Danny, for organizing this. And thank you, everyone, for being on this call. I don't think it's ever an easy discussion to have mm. because, like Louise said earlier, there's so many assumptions that we have and yeah. that gets in the way. So I think it's discussions like these, it's conversations like these that um, sort of brings us together and gives us a different understanding. It's a it's an easy question to answer. I think it's an easy question to answer because I've, I've um, experienced it on so many levels. I think in the last two years, just with my awareness and, and seeing things, I've, I've seen more. But maybe two things to highlight before I answer that question is with so much, um, with so much talk in social media about racism, and we know that there's so much talk and there's, there's so much tension. I, I do want to say that we, we do need to be careful like how much that we take in. So not everything is about racism. There's some things about people's hearts. There's um, some things that, um, yeah, it's just different things that can bring about uh, different behaviors. So not everything is about racism. Mm. And then secondly, I do want to add as much as I know the narrative and the story right now is about um, the legacy of apartheid, colonialism, um, oppression. But I do want to bring across that, especially people of color, so I speak for myself, that I don't necessarily want to have this woe is me mindset or this woe is me type of um, story because I think the difficulty or the the trouble with having a story like that is that you you almost get too focused on on being the victim. Mm. And what I'm seeing is that God has, is, and is still destroying the legacy of apartheid. I know he's, he's doing it in my life on a, on a daily basis almost, yeah. but he is doing it. So that's the two things that I want to highlight. So the legacy of apartheid, I think it affects um, me, it affects my family, it affects the wider community on so many levels. Economically, I think it affects us in that I read a stat the other day on Stats essay that the average black man earns about 7,000 rand compared to the average white man who earns about 24,000 rand. Wow. So that's almost triple the amount. So economically, it affects you on so many levels because you you just can't create wealth. You just can't um, create any, yeah, or generate any wealth. So economically, it affects you there. Socially, I think it affects you. Um, I've thought about this for a while. There's, when you leave your home, or when growing up, um, just the, how your hair looked or the color of your skin. So you almost walk into a system where you just feel wrong. So wow. everything about you, you just feel wrong. You can't explain it. You can't articulate it. It's just wrong. And I think that affects you on so many levels. That affects how you interact. That affects the amount of confidence you have. I've seen it with my nine-year-old girl now that the amount of confidence that she has, and you can see is lacking um, because when she goes out into the world, this, this, the system or this feeling is just wrong, but you can't articulate it. So, so economically it affects you, socially it affects you. I think mentally it affects you because you, you struggle with so many thoughts of not being good enough. And like I mentioned earlier, obviously you can't attribute, I don't want to attribute all of these thoughts just to, oh, it's because of racism, it's because of the legacy of apartheid. Because I don't think I'll be giving a proper perspective or I don't think I'll have a balanced view of what's going on. But I think um, in terms of mentally, you do struggle with these things. You do struggle when you when you in an environment or in an environment that's not your own and you have to struggle to assimilate. So Louise brought something up about um, being organized <laughs> and so like certain cultures believe, um, you know, you're very organized and you come into this culture and you suddenly the person that's not organized. And in this culture, that cultural capital of being organized is valued. And you come into this culture, but your cultural capital is not valued. So who you are as a person is not even seen or what you have. And I think the danger with that is that you lack, you don't spot potential. 
So what we're seeing in Cape Town, which is one of the most unequal cities in the world, so you see it at a lot of leadership levels, you might not see people of color at those levels. And I think it's because you, you know, your, your, your culture, you, as a person of color, you just don't have cultural capital when you enter the professional environment or environment that is dictated by certain things that you need to have. Um, so, yeah, I think on a lot of levels, emotionally, it affects you because um, you in a fight to either, like from what I see is going on now, you either get angry about what's going on and that affects you emotionally or yeah. you hide and you suppress what's going on and that affects you emotionally. So trying to find the balance where you are loving and you just at peace with yourself is not an easy thing to do. But like I said at the beginning, God is doing some wonderful things in people's lives. And I know God is doing some wonderful things in my life with regards to this. Johnny, that's fantastic. Thank you for giving us that insight, which is so helpful. And I mean, it strikes me that, it strikes me as weird, if I'm honest, that, you know, in your own country, as it were, that you feel that you're, you know, that you don't necessarily have the, the capital that you need to, you're seen as not the dominant culture. And that must be a really bizarre thing to be, feel that when you're, you know, in your own country, as it were. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Or maybe an example of how it played out in, in, in your football career, for instance? Um, so for a long time, I think the worst part is that you don't even know. You just, this is the system. So it. it's almost normal. It's, it's almost normal not to have a voice. It's almost normal to walk into a room and um, sort of the parents having a conversation and you, you just, you know, you, you, you're you just the child in it, although you're, like, you're an adult, but yeah. you just feel like the child. So it's almost like, I think a lot of people don't fully realize this. I think it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you, but right. also to help you overcome it in a way that honors God and honors people. Um, I think these power relationships don't just happen in a, in a white colored um, sort of setting. I think it happens everywhere. I think, um, and this is something that I've thought about because of apartheid, because of oppression, you start seeing oppression everywhere. You start seeing oppression in your household because um, that's just what you saw. That's just what you learned. So I see it played out in um, a number, a number of situations where there's um, there's been time. Okay, I'll possibly give you an example. Yeah. So we had a a a, a session with um, some of the kids that we teach, and. Um, the person who was speaking asked everybody to stand up. So majority, I think it was 90% colored and black and there was um, one white kid that was in the room. And they asked everybody to stand up when you speak. And they were going around the room and they asked, um, just before the white kid spoke, they told this um, black kid, um, he was seated while he was speaking. So they said, please stand up. And he did. And then it came to the white kid and he was seated and they let him sit on. Ah. And then when it went to the following kid, he was, he, he, he automatically stood up. And for me, I think it's not even, I think we sometimes, we, we define by the system. The system defines us all on either side. It defines you to, to either uh, be in a position of power or defines you in, I'm not in power. So yeah, I think the system defines us, which is the, which is the big problem. Yeah, wow. Would you mind saying, I, I, I do, Bruce had mentioned to me that there was a really significant moment between you two guys um, uh, where you were sort of planning something together. Um, and uh, do you know the incident I'm talking about? I do, um, I do. Yeah, do you want to say a bit about that? Because I think that's quite illustrative. Bruce, Bruce calls it the night. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the night. I, I got um... converted that night. <laughs> we... We, we were planning to, the following day, we were going to have an a interview. Bruce was going to interview me um, at, at some event. And we were going over the specifics of what we're going to do. And normally our interaction is very natural. We don't normally plan things. And then, but I knew, okay, some things have to be planned and that's fine. 
So we, I came to his house. We were busy planning. And um, so I think it went into a, for me, I can't speak for Bruce, but for me it went into a sort of situation or, a, or an area where we overthinking this thing and we over planning this thing. And I voiced my opinion once and um, Bruce, uh, <laughs> he went, oh, he, he, he spoke over it. And then the second time I voiced it again and he spoke over it. And then there was this third time I, sh I shut down because I was like, there's nothing more I can do. There's nothing more I can say. And he saw me shut down and he did this. He asked, um, like, what's going on? And I said, um, I feel we're overthinking this. And he said, um, I don't know ex his exact words, but in that moment, he gave me freedom to be myself. And he gave me a voice in that moment. And in that moment, he said, okay, no problem. We're going to go with what you want to do with how you feel it's going to uh, at least happen. The following day was obviously a success, but um, <laughs> what I'm trying to bring, <laughs> what I'm trying to bring across is that he heard me. So he heard um, and he saw. Yes. So he heard and he saw and he, 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 he actually just gave me the freedom to um, voice what I wanted to voice. And I think it's, it's in moments like those that so much of the growth happens on both sides. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and those, you know, sometimes we do look for these big moments, or but it's in those small moments that the Holy Spirit is busy speaking to yeah. you, like you mentioned it early, or to the other person that yeah. that yeah. really brings about the growth. Yeah, fantastic. So you know, it was it, I guess you were saying it was actually quite hard for you to challenge Bruce. You know, as a, as a white guy, that was something that you weren't necessarily comfortable doing absolutely yeah yeah and then the fact that he is a white guy was able to say oh johnny actually maybe you're right you know what do you think yeah yeah brilliant thank you so that, much just, just just to say that 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 was an in, incredibly um impactful moment for me um and because me and Johnny had, had, you know, me and Johnny had known each other for five years. Um, and, and I don't think, you know, one of the things that really scares me about that is I wonder how many other occasions there have been where I haven't understood how the lens of the apartheid legacy that I think, I think what, what Johnny's talking about is socialization of that. Yeah, I, yeah. I just assume we're, we're, we're mates and he's going to, he, he's just going to come back at me, you know? And, and actually the reality, the reality is that there, there are wounds that he was still carrying and there are wounds that I'm still creating. Mm -hmm. And, yeah that that i'm going to be honest johnny I, we, we've debriefed on this but i i really don't it, it's caused me to to reflect a lot more on on how i you know on on how i interact um and being an extrovert feeler and and having leadership you know i can talk about being a servant leader etc cetera, etc cetera, but but the but the reality the reality is as everyone could hear on this call tonight I like to talk, you know, and, and I don't. Uh, you, I stop putting faces, lad. You know, I like to talk, um, but but there are there, but there are, there are moments that you can so easily miss, um, and if I could do that to Johnny, you know, and and make Johnny feel that his voice didn't matter, how many other people have I done that with? And I have assumed the privilege of my whiteness yeah. Um, yeah. In, 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 in a society where, where, where all of us have been disabled by the demonic sin of racism. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Johnny, we're um, just coming to the end of our time before um, we just wrap up with a few other things. But um, is there anything that you would like just to say to all of us, really? Um, just the lessons you've learned that you think would be helpful for us to 
to learn or things that we may we just need to be aware of as we as we navigate these 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 sort of issues so um one of my favorite um <laughs> maybe i mustn't mention his name one of my favorite comedians <laughs> he said this he said um fear does not bring about lasting change and i think fear from both sides from my side was a fear of interacting fear of building relationships fear of um yeah um creating a multi ethnic body of christ doesn't um yeah doesn't build or doesn't bring about lasting change and the second thing he said the system has gone trial so we sometimes fight each other and we have this assumptions of each other and we you know that holds us back from loving each other yeah, yeah. but it's the system that needs to go on trial it's the system that we need to fight and i know as much as bruce has said um how impactful that was for him i think a lesson to learn is that this can't be done without the holy spirit mm. otherwise we're going to go out tomorrow and we're going to be start to, we're going to be try to change behaviors yeah. but the holy spirit wants our hearts and the, and is and he has so much grace with us also so yeah. i think when that happens when we start to listen to him i'm talking from both sides yeah, there's yeah. a lot of listening that i need to do there was some listening that i needed to do today with cross culture but when we listen more to what the holy spirit is saying i think something beautiful happens but it happens in a natural way it doesn't happen in a in a forced way so as much as we have we have really good intentions about trying to make change i think yeah the one that can really bring change which is jesus is we need to follow him and see what is he doing where is he doing it how is he doing it what is the plan for doing it johnny thank you so much was there anything just any, i don't want to you know, cut off anything you wanted to say. Is there anything else you wanted to add, or uh, shall I hand that back over to Bruce and Louise? Uh, congratulations, Louise, on your fiftieth. Thanks, Bruce, for exposing that. <laughs> that was two deep. years ago, so I've yeah. really exposed it, Johnny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Bruce, we don't need to see how old we're going to be in a month or so, do we? Yeah. No, 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 really. don't go there. No, no. So, uh, Johnny, thank you so much honestly i've been um so blessed by what you shared with us and i really just appreciate your honesty and your openness with us and uh and we're going to have some q a uh shortly so you know if you've got any questions for johnny um then please uh make a note of them and uh we'll ask them in a minute so i just want to hand back over to bruce and louise and just maybe just a couple of things about what you think this you know as you've thought and prayed this through what do you think there's some lessons that there might be for us as the British church and most of us on the call on, on in the British church. Uh, what do you think lessons, what lessons have we got to learn? Wow. Um, one of the things that God has reminded me of through his word recently is actually in the Exodus story, which is of course is the first and prototype story of redemption. Um, in the biblical narrative and when God meets Moses in the burning bush um, and you know we we often focus on um, that you know that supernatural moment uh, we often focus on God's self-designation of himself I am who I am etc but one of the things that struck me afresh as i was reading it again recently is that god tells moses that he has seen the oppression of the slaves and he has heard their cry and and you know we're called to be holy as god is holy so that means that we are called to hear the we're called to see the hurt and johnny said it he, he mentioned seeing and, and and hearing or seeing and listening i think part of part of part of one of the ways that we can all um begin to um walk a journey and we're all going to be starting in different places some of us might be in communities that are are fairly homogenous some of us are going to be in communities that are quite diverse 
So I realize that what I'm about to say will, will vary, but even if you're in a homogenous community, it's no, you're still part of British society. Yeah, and, and racism is a reality for a lived experience, you know, for, for many people in our society. And we, we need to learn to see and we need to learn to listen to uh, the stories of those who've been hurt by uh, oppressive narratives and uh, oppressive systems. They have no place in the body of Christ. So, so why should we want to not listen and see? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, because if we're going to create communities, as God, I believe, intends us to, in the power of the Holy Spirit, as, as Johnny has reminded us, then, then it's not going to happen. You know, and if, you know, one of the things that you will know, Danny, as, as, as a pastor, one of the things I know is that when somebody's hurting in front of you, you don't just tell them to pull themselves together and get over it. <laughs> That's right? what I've been doing wrong. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe it is, Danny. You, you know, <laughs> you, it, it, whether or not the pain is valid. Yeah. 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 Right? You, you see the pain and you listen. Yeah? And, 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 and then it's about, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, discerning where you need to go. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and, and I think... If that's true in a pastoral counselling situation, if that's true when, 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 when somebody is hurting for another reason in the church, why is it we can't do that when it comes to issues of, of racial justice? Um, why is it that we, 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 we suddenly want to actually take our, you know, take our, you know, our prompts from, from the world? You know, the, the mandate of the church is to act justly, you know, and, and to, to seek mercy, you know, and, and, um, uh, and, and, and so if, that, if that, that is the case, I would say go on a journey, start looking, yeah, and start listening, because you can't act as God wants you to act until you've done that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And it's that whole sense of walking in other people's shoes, isn't it? And we'll, yeah. you know, um, so have you got any sort of um, ideas of what we can, you've, met, you've given us some already, but any ideas of what we can do as churches, maybe as individuals um, to join in the Ministry of Racial Justice and Ethnic Reconciliation? I think you might have some resources for us. Yeah, there'd there definitely be some, let's, let's see if I can get this, this, this up uh, just there with me. Um, um, here we go. Actually, not that. Johnny might know why that. No, so no, actually, here, here's, here's yeah. some, yeah, whoops. Oh. Here, here, here's some books. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you see, that? see that. Yeah, yeah so in, in, the British, in the British context, this only came out, I think, last year. There were two books in the British context from, 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 from um, you know, Christ followers' perspective. One is Ben Lindsay's We Need to Talk About Race. Uh, ben led a, a Baptist church in London, um, and and I think this is a th th this is this is an excellent resource um, from from a Christian perspective in written from the UK context. I would really recommend this. And the other one is, and I'm quite embarrassed about this because I think his wife's on the call, and this is <laughs> this is actually James's James Chambers's father-in-law. Uh, this is called The Truth About Racism by uh, uh, Philip Asante. Uh, it's, it's a super book. Again, gives a, you know, it's a lived experience, but gives really good biblical basis for us to uh, address this from. And then um, from, from the United States, an, uh, 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 an old legend, uh, incredi incredible biblical basis for biblical justice and, and racial reconciliation book called One Blood. This is probably going to be his last book. It's called His Parting Words to the Church on Race. And whilst wow. it's written from the American context, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a magnificent prophetic read. Um, and then the other one is a terrible book title, again from America, a former NLF uh, footballer in, called uh, Derwin Gray. Um, he, he, he is leading a church that has broken free from this sort of mega church church growth model 
which is basically about reaching, you know, people who are like you uh, to, 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 to say, no, we, in a divided society, God is calling us to be multi-ethnic. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is a brilliant um, uh, b- biblical basis for, uh, with practical tools for how a church can um, transition to be authentically uh, multi-ethnic. Uh, there, 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 there are other resources out there. Uh, there are other resources uh, that I, and other voices that are well worth listening to from outside the church. Uh, but I think they're good starting places for followers of Jesus. I would say to churches that are in, that do have uh, multi-ethnic congregations, they actually, maybe, may, maybe they should be telling me things because, because they might well be doing them. But I think, you know, one of the things I picked up when I was back in the UK in, in some contexts that were increasingly multi-ethnic is that uh, the, the good questions were being asked about how do we create multi-ethnic worship? But one of the things I would always say in response to that is that uh, multi-ethnic worship is not the destination, uh, but it's important because, because our worship shapes who we are as the people of God. So, you know, if you'd been in our church on Sunday, we had three different people open in prayer in three different languages. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, we, we will sing in different languages, um, but the primary form of communication will be in, in English because it's at least everybody's second language. You know, so, but, but we don't do everything in English and we don't do, do everything just from one culture. We don't just sing Hillsong or, or whatever. We don't just sing Western music. Um, you know, we, 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 uh, and we need to do, we need to do more, but we need to incorporate, you know, cultural forms and practices in our worship that reflect the diversity of our congregations. But that's not, that's not the destination because we can, and what's happened here in South Africa is we have multi-ethnic congregations, but no multi-ethnic sharing of life. So people go back to their, so it's only in the marketplace and it's only in the pew on Sunday where people are together and then they go their separate ways and there's no shared story. There's no listening to one another's pain. And, and so, you know, there's no listening to and sharing one another's different cultures. And so until that starts to happen, we, you know, what we've got is the facade of multi-ethnicity. Uh, we haven't got true lasting transformation. And I think that's, you know, I'm glad to say there are some churches here that, and church leaders that are beginning to ask those questions. Uh, but if we're to see God's redemptive work go deep into our, our culture and our society, and as Johnny said, systems, then the, sa- the same in the UK. So, and for those who aren't, I, I, I would say read, find out, um, you know, if you've got relationships in the workplace with, with people of different cultures, why not just, why, why, why not be intentional about finding out about people's stories yeah, them. and taking a genuine interest in, you know, if somebody's Muslim, if somebody's Hindu, if somebody's Sikh, somebody's from a different cultural background, you know, different religious backgrounds, you know, um, if, t- take a genuine interest in getting to know their story, uh, find out more. Uh, I think that's what the Apostle Paul did in Athens. He spent all that time walking around Athens, finding out what they believed. Yeah. Uh, And that gave him permission to speak. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, I know many of us on this um, call uh, support Bruce and Louise financially. Um, But if if you would like the opportunity to find out how to do that, I think you've got another slide, Bruce. Ah, Um, Of course we have. There we go. When we prepared earlier, it's just like Blue Peter. This is great. So that ages me, doesn't it? Is Blue Peter still on, by the way? I have no idea. Um, so, yeah. So you've got the details there. Um, I think you've got a bit of an insight into the amazing work that Bruce and Louise do. Um, uh, myself, my wife, Debs, and Chris and Sarah on this call have been over and seen some of the amazing work that, that um, Bruce and Louise do f- firsthand. Um, and I can... I can honestly tell you it's making a massive difference to the lives of the people that they're um, interacting with. And there is that real intentionality about um, building relationships and discerning who God is calling them to build relationships with. And I can, you know, just testify to how powerful that is. So if you haven't yet um, got around to giving 
to Bruce and Louise, then I'd really, really encourage you to to do that. I know for some of you, times might be hard financially, so don't feel under any uh, guilt or compulsion. You know, God loves a cheerful giver, not a reluctant one. So if you feel you want to get a bit more cheer uh, by giving, <laughs> um, no, but it is. I mean, giving can be a real blessing, actually. So um, if you feel that's something that God might be encouraging you to do, then you've got the details there. Okay. We've gone, well, we've, we, we were just over an hour, that's what I said. Um, so what I suggest we do um, is that we just have a five-minute um, five minute break. So if we come back, or four minutes, I'm going to be, you know, four minutes. So if we come back at 10 to 9, uh, if you need to go off to use the loo or get a coffee or whatever it might be, um, then, yeah, but come back at, at 9 o'clock. If you want to put some questions in the chat, if you prefer not to ask them, that's fine. Uh, but I think there's a there's a few you know that we can just about manage to I can see everyone on the screen so if you've got a question um, I think if you wave your hand at me when we come back then we'll be able to do 